So, we're in our series, Things Jesus Never Said. Things Jesus Never Said. And today, we want to look at what has become a pretty popular expression and quote in our culture, and that is that only God can judge. Only God can judge. So we're going to talk about uh, judgment. Like, what is judgment? And what is our prerogative, if any, to judge? Now, many of you could surmise by the tenor of this series that when I say only God can judge, this must be something that Jesus didn't say. So we're going to kind of look at that a little bit more. But when we talk about this subject of judgment— one of the problems is uh, judgment is challenging, right? We all understand that making judgments uh, in the world is a challenging thing. For one thing, we uh, sometimes make bad judgments because we don't have all the facts. Have you ever been in a situation where, you know, a couple of kids come running in and, you know, they're mad at each other. One's crying, you know, got some big sore or bruise or cut or something. And they have two different stories about what just happened outside of your view. Right? And it's your responsibility or your job to try to determine from these two opposing stories what is actually the truth. And sometimes it's really, really difficult to make judgments because we don't have all the facts. If you weren't an eyewitness to that particular event, you're kind of depending on and sorting through some of the mystery of what's being suggested to you. Or have you ever heard um, of some episode recounted to you by a person, right, where it was clearly that person's side of the story? And immediately you kind of came to this opinion or this impression of what happened or what you think. And it's not until afterward when you hear the other person's side of the story that it's like, oh my goodness, I was completely wrong in my understanding of what happened and in my estimation of that thing. And we understand that in those moments, like our judgment is sometimes not exactly what it ought to be. Another challenging thing about judgment is that Let's face it, we're all biased, right? We all are biased. We all carry biases with us into the world in which we live. For one thing, we all experience the world differently from one another, right? All the people in this room experience the world differently from others. Even uh, where we have a, an assembly of people that are, you know, many of us have very, very common interests, like right? and a common bond and perhaps a common outlook and worldview. Uh, the reality is we still experience the world differently from one another. And so uh, for me to cast judgment on another person sometimes can be challenging because I don't see things the way that person sees things. Right? I, I look at things through the lens, through the filter that I have for my own bias, for my own life. Uh, it's as easy as uh, where you have one person who's maybe a very optimistic person, always looking at the bright side of things. Right? And something happens in their life, and they kind of just let it like, roll off their back. Like it was no big deal. And they just kind of go on their merry own way. But then you have another person who has a very pessimistic very negative outlook toward life. That exact same thing happens to that person, and it's like the world is about to end. Why? Because we experience the world differently from one another. And then thirdly, judgment is challenging because we all have blind spots. We'll look at this in a moment, but we just I think we would all admit quite freely that we have blind spots in our lives, that there's things that we can't see ourselves that maybe are very apparent to other people, which is really interesting. Right? Because we have the ability to pinpoint some of the failings or weaknesses of another person while we're unconscious about our own. Have you ever been in a setting where you were observing the behavior of a person and they were just like, you could not believe like how out of control that person was. Maybe you're in a restaurant, right? And this person is just kind of loud and they're like almost abusive toward the waiter or the waitress in the way that they're treating that person. And then like now that they've got your attention, you're kind of listening and you're hearing the conversation that happens and that that person is even treating uh, his or her own family members terribly. And you're wondering, how could this person like walk through life behaving like that? Right? Because it's so easy to see that in other people, but we're oftentimes unconscious of our, our, our very own stuff. You ever been around somebody who has such incredibly bad breath? You're like, how does this person not know, right? I mean, that person is the closest person to that person. 
how do they not know what that smells like right now, right? But it's just, we, we actually become immune, <laughs> right, to our own scent. We become immune to the things that are most familiar and probably most deeply personal to us. And sometimes it creates these blind spots in our lives. But the question for today is, did Jesus af- actually say, only God can judge? Is that something that came out of the words uh, of Jesus' mouth or the teaching of Jesus? Well, uh, Jesus certainly had some things to say about judgment. And the verse of scripture we're going to look at together this morning would sort of lend some credibility to the idea that we need to be very, very careful about being judgy, about being judgmental, about having this posture of Uh, judgment toward other people. We're in Matthew chapter 7, and we're going to read verses 1 through 5. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. Uh, Matthew 7, this is the third chapter in Jesus's famous Sermon on the Mount. You know, Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is this really long monologue that Jesus has where he's just expounding on an incredible number of subjects and truths about the kingdom of God and how we could better live in this life. And The theme of judgment is actually one of the things that Jesus strikes on. One of the things that Jesus goes after. Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. Let's read it together. Jesus says, Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye... But do not notice the log that is in your own eye. Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is the log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. So Jesus here begins this section of his teaching with the statement, judge not that you be not judged. So Jesus certainly has a warning against judgment, right? That's very different from what we have adopted as only God can judge. Those are two different things. And I'll try to point out to the best of my ability how those things are different. But first of all, what is judgment? What is it? Like, what is judgment? Well, the the very simple kind of working definition for us speaking the English language is that judgment is the process of forming an opinion, right? Or evaluating through discernment and comparison. Uh, Yesterday, I was at the grocery store, and I was judging tomatoes. (laughs) I was buying tomatoes to make salsa with. And you know what I didn't do? I didn't open the bag and go like this, right? Right? and fill the bag with an indiscriminate group of tomatoes. No, what I did was I hand-picked the tomatoes that look good. And occasionally I get to one that looked good, but when I touched it, I didn't like the way it felt. And so I put it back. This is one of the most challenging things about 2020, I think, was being at the grocery store when you weren't supposed to touch produce unless you were going to buy it. Right? Remember that? Right? You reach for the cucumber, and like, oh... It's squishy. (laughs) But the governor says I have to buy it, right? And so he put it in the bag. I I was judging, right? We, we, We form judgments all the time. We form opinions about things all the time. No matter how much we would like to think we have removed ourselves from being judgmental, the reality is that our brains have kicked into high gear for pretty much all of our lives and throughout our day where we are judging certain things. And a lot of that judgment is good and it's important. Now, when Jesus says, judge not that you be not judged, the word that he uses in the Greek language has a variety of meanings. It is this really large spectrum of meaning. From, uh, on the one hand, it could mean choosing, right? Or distinguishing, like choosing uh, between one or two or choosing among multiple things, right? That that is judgment. Uh, to what we would understand to be judgment, where you're actually evaluating something and passing judgment on what you have evaluated, and all the way over to the extreme of condemnation, 
like when a person stands before a judge and jury in a court of law, they are judged according to the evidence and then further judged or condemned if found guilty to some particular punishment. So when Jesus says, well, judge not that you be not judged, we have to understand what is he getting at? Like, what is he talking about when it comes to judgment? Does he simply mean that we're supposed to like completely put our minds, our intellect, our ability to think reasonably and logically, are we supposed to suspend all that? Right? And, and, and try to walk around opinionless of practically anything that's going on? Probably not. Right? And so already we're kind of casting some light on this idea that only God can judge. So let's look a little more deeply at the verses of Scripture one by one. We'll start in verse 1 where Jesus says, Judge not that you be not judged. Now, when he says judge not, it's important for us to know that the tense of this verb is in the present uh, it's an imperative, so it's essentially a command, right? He's saying, do not judge. Much like an imperative statement could be uh, for when I say, go to your room. I'm not asking a question. I'm not inviting dialogue. I'm making a command. And that's what Jesus does. He says, do not judge. But it's in the present tense, which could be translated, do not be in the habit of judging. Like, do not get yourself into the continued state or the continued habit of judging. In fact, if Jesus meant to say, listen, it is imperative that you never, ever, ever, under any circumstances, perform judgment on something or anyone else, he would have used a different tense, but he didn't. He says, do not be in the habit of judging or you will be judged. So what he's not doing, and this is important, what he is not doing is he's not forbidding the process of assessment. Right? A lot of times that's what we consider. In our day and age, when we are told, do not judge, don't judge another person, mind your own business, Stay to your own affairs, right? The idea, the connotation of that is, listen, it doesn't matter what you've heard or what you might be inclined to think about what this other person thinks or feels. Keep it to yourself, right? And not only keep it to yourself, but even try to remove yourself from having those feelings of judgment toward that person. That's, that's, that's the virtue that we celebrate in our society today. But that's not what Jesus is expressing. He is not forbidding an assessment. What he's forbidding is harshness. What he's forbidding is destruction that comes with the way in which we oftentimes do, in fact, judge one another. It's not that I am incapable or not allowed to commit some assessment. It's, is my judgment harsh? Is my judgment destructive? I love what one theologian, 50 years ago, he wrote in his book, John Stott. He said, this does not mean that we're supposed to be blind, right? That Jesus is not asking for us to be blind. What he is asking for us to do is to be generous. When we consider other people, we are supposed to provide a generous amount of space for that individual, and for what that individual expresses. But by no means does it mean that you're supposed to just close your eyes and pretend as if nothing ever happened, right? So this verse is teaching us, don't be in the habit of judging. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but perhaps you might admit uh, to yourself whether or not you have the tendency to be judgmental. Like, is that a condition of your heart? Is that, a, is that a place that you often find yourself in where you are just constantly, whether consciously or not, but casting judgment on other people? Like, and, and holding on to and reserving those feelings of judgment. That is something that you want to bring before the Lord because I don't believe that there's place, you know, for the follower of Jesus to live in that kind of habit. That's what Jesus is expressing to us here. In verse 2, he says that, the judgment that you pronounce, that will be used as a basis for your judgment in the future. He says, with what measure you judge, it shall be measured also to you. 
in the future. So uh, what he's essentially saying here is, listen, when you commit to uh, passing judgment on another person, what you have done is you have opened the door to be judged by that same measure. When he talks about these measures, he has in mind, I think, uh, the economic system of his day that depended greatly on uh, scales and balances, weights and measures, right? Like this is how business was transacted. You didn't slide your card or insert the chip or even necessarily just hand over several bills of cash. No, there was a lot that was done in terms of weight and measure. And one of the big ripoffs of Jesus's day were merchants that used faulty measures, right? They took advantage of their buyers because their measures were not just. In fact, that is a thing that is forbidden in scripture. One of the things that God hates are unjust weights, unjust measures. And Jesus says, listen, the measure with which you pass judgment on another person, that same device is going to be used for you. And so there's this word of caution, this very deep, very serious word of caution that we're supposed to internalize for ourselves as we try to determine, like, what does it mean for me to judge righteously? Verse 3, Jesus says, why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye? So now he starts to illustrate the point and point out the the weird kind of fallacy that comes in the way in which we oftentimes judge each other. Why do you see the speck, right? This little fragment of a thing, uh, call it a splinter, you know, a tiny piece of wood. Now we all know you get something in your eye, no matter how small it is, it is irritating, right? And you've got to get it out of there because it's actually irritating your eye until you get rid of it. And Jesus says, you see, you see the speck in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye. And so Jesus is making this comparison between what we see in other people and what we fail to see in ourselves. That is that we see the very small thing, right? The wood chip, the splinter, the speck. We see that, but we don't even notice the beam. And when he uses the word beam here, he's talking about uh, a, a piece of lumber that is used in a load-bearing assignment for a building, like the main beams that hold up a structure, that hold up a roof. He says, this is what you've got going on in you. And you don't even notice it, but you see very clearly this little speck in the eye of your brother. How many of you know that when it comes to our perception of things, our perception is often selective, right? We see so easily, so readily in other people what we fail to see in ourselves. Maybe because it's not a one-for-one -one kind of thing, but you find Jesus again and again throughout his teaching constantly raising some issue and saying, hey, listen, this is how you feel about this particular thing. And yet, look, like, you're completely way off base, way off track in this other thing that is essentially the same thing, right? And he says that's hypocrisy. Now, oftentimes when we look and when we read this, because you probably, many of you have heard this, this whole speck in the eye, log in the eye thing. And we think that what Jesus is talking about is this comparison between, you know, like ranks of sinners, right? Because that's how we see things. We think that Jesus, what he's saying is, listen, you, you see this little thing in a person's life, right? Um, this, this, this person who's like, if we could call him this, a little sinner, guilty of some little sin, right? And you're picking on them for that little sin while you over here, you've got this big sin. You're a big sinner, right? You actually outrank this person in your sinfulness. So who are you to actually pass judgment on that person? That's how we often interpret it, but that's not what Jesus is saying. That's not what he's saying. He's not ranking between the two. In fact, because if he were, listen, if he were, 
then you would feel free so long as your sin wasn't actually as great as the other person's sin, you would then feel free to pass judgment on that person, right? Because you're like, oh, no, 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 that person's got the log. I've got the spec. I'm good. I can pass judgment. But that's not what he's doing. That's not what he's saying. What Jesus is doing is he is comparing what the difference is between some small matter and some large matter. The small matter, the speck in your brother's eye, the small matter is what you see is wrong in the other person. The large matter is what God sees is wrong in you. Right? That's what he's saying. He's saying, it, from your perception, from your understanding, you see this thing and it's so big and grand and it's got to be dealt with, right? And you are emotionally invested in this speck in your brother's eye. And as far as God is concerned, that is a small matter with regard to your life. The big matter is what God sees in you, what God sees in me. One of the reasons why we love passing judgment on other people is because of how good it makes us feel, right? And again, I, like, I'm not saying we do this audibly, but when we're able to elevate our own um, position of self by putting down other people, that makes us feel good. Right? It makes me feel superior. It makes me feel better than. It makes me feel more worthy, of more value. But the problem with passing that kind of judgment is that it has no place in the mind of Christ. What it's actually doing is ignoring my own issue. It's ignoring your own issue. Right? Again, to quote John Stott, he says, when we pass judgment on another person, we experience the pleasure of self-righteousness without the pain of penitence. See, penitence is painful. Like the process of confessing our sin before God, the process of repenting of our sin, of turning away from our sin and turning back to God. That is a painful process that we as followers of Jesus are called to do. But oftentimes we substitute the need for our own personal penitence, which is painful. We substitute it with the pleasure of simply passing judgment on others. Well, at least I'm not as bad as that person. I mean, look at it. I got my act together way more that, than that person does. There's no place for it. In the mind of Jesus. Verse 5, Jesus says, You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Now, what I read here is Jesus actually cracking the door open to the fact that, no, we are in fact actually supposed to be in the place of providing judgment, of assessment. That I don't think what he's saying is, hey, Let's be honest. You will never, ever get the beam out so that you can adequately come alongside that other person and uh, build up and work with that person regarding their stuff. I don't think that's what he's saying. I think what he's saying is that there's a requirement that we have a different posture when it comes to how we perform judgment. Listen, we all do it. We all judge. The, the, for It's a fallacy to say that none of us should judge, right? The person that says none of us should judge has made a judgment that none of us should judge. Like, it is a self-defeating argument. It doesn't work in logic or philosophy, and it certainly doesn't work in real life. So how do we do judgment properly? Well, I think what Jesus is essentially saying here is, hey, put your own oxygen mask on first. Right? And you ever fly in an airplane? What do they tell you? When the oxygen masks fall down, you put yours on and then you mind your own business, right? 
No, that's not what they say. (laughs) Neither do they say, you know, make sure you help somebody else before you help yourself, right? Because you're going to be dead and therefore no good to anybody. So what do we do with the oxygen mask? We put ours on first and then we move on to the person who needs help. And the same goes when it comes to judgment. Like judgment is not supposed to be harsh. It is not supposed to be destructive. It is not supposed to be critical for the purpose of putting that person down and thereby elevating myself. But it doesn't mean that judgment doesn't happen. What's forbidden here is passing judgment on another person from a place of superiority. That is that, you know, I stand up here and therefore am in a position to pass judgment on you. My life is more put together than yours, and so therefore I can pass judgment on you. I am less evil than you are, and so therefore I can pass judgment on you. No, the posture is entirely turned upside down. And what's required in our judgment is that we judge from a posture of humility, an understanding of our own brokenness, an understanding of the the junk that we ourselves own, junk that maybe nobody else even knows about, stuff that we'd be embarrassed to put up on the big screen here in front of everybody for them to see. So when our stuff is hidden and when our weaknesses are not front and center like the weaknesses and the sin of another person that seems so front and center, We have to be so, so, so careful about the humility, the posture of humility that we take in those instances. Not only that, but we have to judge from a place of empathy to the best of our ability. The requirement that we actually try to understand and hear and immerse ourselves in the world that that other person is experiencing. You say, well, you know what? When it comes to judgment, forget it. I'm out. I just don't want to do it. I get that. You might be saying, well, who am I to judge? You ever said that? Who am I to judge? Who am I to judge? You know what that is a lot of times? That is a cop-out. You've already made the judgment. You just don't want to admit it. Right? And you also, listen, you also don't want to do the hard work of actually hearing and feeling and seeing and deliberating on, right? It's just, well, who am I to judge? You know, I just, I'm just going to defer to another person's private preferences, right? And I'm going to suspend my own reckoning of what is right and wrong. Have you ever found yourself doing that? Like there's something that you've been confronted with and you're like, that doesn't sound right. <laughs> Right? Like something, some, something is proposed to you as truth or proposed to you as this is how it is. And you're like, that doesn't settle well. Like that just, there's, I mean, I, I, haven't, I haven't done the work. You know, this person, like they sound like an expert. They sound like they know what they're talking about or they're speaking from their own experience. So who am I to judge? What am I to say? Right? That's where we find ourselves oftentimes. That's one of the difficulties about this whole judging business anyway. Listen, one of the tactics that I think are used to try to actually get people to just like buzz off is to silence them. Right? That's one of the tactics. Uh, when the argument perhaps is not quite sufficient, we can always revert to, well, my truth is my truth, right? Or my experience is my experience. My understanding of things is my understanding of things. And I get it. Like people, like we live in a free country and everybody's free to think and do whatever they want. I love that. It's one of my favorite things about the United States of America is that I am technically supposed to be allowed to think and feel for myself without being afraid that everybody's going to cancel me, right? Because I have an opinion that's different from the rest of, um, Pop culture, perhaps. Now, I get that world is shrinking very, very quickly. But that's the way it's supposed to be. Like, we, we're supposed to be free to dialogue. 
And yet, what we oftentimes want to do when it comes to so many issues is, well, let's just shut up the opposition. I couldn't help but think about like, how this kind of surfaces in uh, and among like, uh, the, the pro-choice circles, like when, in the issue of abortion. You know, you, you, you read signs that say things like, hey, don't force your abortion views on my body. Right? So you have these two sides making their cases. One, you know, making the case for unborn life. One making the case for a woman's choice, right? And so we have all this kind of back and forth, right? We have all this dialogue. We have all these very, very hot, very, very hot feelings about how we're supposed to view this particular issue, right? But pro-choice side, most notably, like one of the things they want to do is say, hey, this is my body, and so it's none of your business. Well, I get that, but does that mean that the dialogue is therefore supposed to end? Is that just supposed to shut up the other side? My body, my choice, you have no right to say or to speak into any of that? You know, this is hard for me to say because I fall in the category, but I mean, I personally find a little annoying. You know, one of the attacks uh, that, that we— that I, you know, we experience, that I experience in the world today is, you know, that uh, I'm a white male, and so I'm not supposed to have an opinion on anything. I call, how, how am I supposed to know how another person feels? How am I supposed to know what another person is going through? And I get that. Like, there's a lot of truth to the reality that, like, I don't actually have um, personal experience in so many things that other people feel. Like I said, you know, everybody experiences the world differently. But as far as the world's concerned today, I'm just supposed to shut my mouth. Like, I probably shouldn't even be talking today. Is that what we're looking for? I don't think so. I don't think so. We question our capacity to make judgments on things. Like, we, uh, and this is what makes judgment tricky is that, I don't know if you've experienced, but I certainly have. Like, sometimes I feel like I have this like low self-esteem when it comes to making judgments on certain things. You ever, again, been fed information from a so-called expert? And it's like, well, what, you know, what do you know? <laughs> what, am, what am I, this is what, this is what they're telling me. It doesn't sit right. It doesn't sound right, but th like that's what this person is telling me. And sometimes our self-esteem is brought way down when it comes to actually being kind of bold about making an assessment between right and wrong. And we don't, at the end of the day, we don't want to be responsible for decisions in complicated matters. We just don't. And so, so a lot of times we just check out, right? This is the, well, who am I to judge kind of idea. But I wonder, and listen, I can't help but wonder, as much as I would love to do that, listen, I am not, I am not like dying to go out in the world and make a name for myself you know, by just coming against a whole bunch of stuff. Like that is not, if it were up to me, I would live my happy, peaceably, peaceable, peaceable life, you know, live and let live, you know. Like the reality is there's a lot of stuff going on in the world today that has no effect on me. It doesn't, doesn't, it doesn't touch my life. It doesn't really make a difference between whether or not I can enjoy the happiness of life or not, right? And so, so I could have this kind of carefree, well, I don't care, forget it. No skin off my nose. What would I care about that? But I can't get away from the, the question, well, is that, really, is that really for the follower of Jesus? Is that really for the follower of Jesus who has been commissioned to go into the world? And what did Jesus say? He said, you are the light of the world. How often do we just take that light and hide it? He said, you are the salt of the earth. Are we actually like salt in the savory sense or are we just saltless? I can't help but think that Jesus wants more from his people who are coming behind him, who are commissioned with bringing the good news of God's forgiveness through Jesus Christ into the world. And sometimes that means making stands for things that, you know, if we had the 
choice. We'd rather not have to make such a big deal about it. So we are, in fact, called, I believe, to judge, to make righteous judgment. And that judgment should look a lot like a judgment that is done with mercy, that is done with grace, that is done with an incredible, generous, copious amount of space for another person. That judgment cannot be harsh. That judgment cannot be destructive. Because in doing so, we are inviting the same measure of judgment into our own lives. And by the way, it doesn't do anybody any good anyway. But we are to judge. And we are to uphold truth. There are scriptures here that I want to share as we close out this morning that remind us of the importance of doing the hard work of what we're talking about today. And that's what it is. And that's why we don't like to do it. Because a lot of times it's hard work. Like I said, it's so much easier for me to just drive home, pull into the garage, let the garage door close, I'm lying. I'm not allowed to do that because my wife has the space in the garage. But <laughs> if I did, pull into the garage, garage door closes, I live my own life, live and let live, live and let be. But I think there's more for the follower of Jesus that we are called into. Jesus, who says in verse 1, judge not that you be not judged, just a handful of verses later says, in Matthew 7, 15, he says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. I don't know about you, but that sounds a lot like making judgment. Like you shouldn't even be listening to what I say and just, just accepting it because I happen to be the person who's saying, I know that you're not doing that. Right? But you're not supposed to. You should weigh what I say with what God's word says, you should weigh what I say with what the spirit bears witness of in your spirit. Jesus also says later on in Matthew's gospel, and many false prophets will arise and lead many astray, that there will actually be this movement of people away from the truth because people will be leading them away from the truth. Peter, one of Jesus' closest disciples, says in his second letter, there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their sensuality. And because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. We live in a world that says, well, there is no truth. What is truth? Your truth is your truth. My truth is my truth. That sounds a lot like what Peter is warning against here. That the way of truth will be blasphemed as people migrate away from the, the truth. Jude, in his letter, verse 4, for certain people have crept in unnoticed. That is, they have come into the community of faith and people haven't even noticed them. Ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and they deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. You want to tell me that there isn't a movement within our churches today to move people away from the real gospel of grace into something that more represents the sens sensuality of our own desires. Jude warned of us, warned us about it 2,000 years ago. Paul, in his letter, second letter to Timothy, an up and coming pastor, a leader in his own church, he says, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. They're not going to want to hear it anymore. But having itching ears, they will accumulate. That is, they'll bring together for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. They're going to walk through the grocery store of preachers. And they're going to say, boy, I'd like a bite of that. And I'll take some of that on the side, right? And I'm going to stay out of aisle nine because they preach too hard. But this is what will happen. They will turn away from listening to the truth and they will wander off into myths. Again, I'm not making this up. This is what we are told 2,000 years ago by those that followed in the footsteps of Jesus. Colossians 2.8, and I close with this. Paul says, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. 
Jesus is at and will always be at the very, very center of everything that we do and teach and believe and love. And so when it comes to only God can judge, I would say, well, Jesus never said that. But the judgment that Jesus wants to characterize our lives is a judgment that is full of grace. It is full of mercy. It is full of room. It is generous. It is inviting. And it ultimately will introduce a person to the love of God. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you so much for just this opportunity to look more deeply into your word regarding this very, very difficult subject. And Lord, I bet there are some things that I kind of messed up, maybe even got a little wrong in my assessment of things. But Lord, I just ask that your word would do the work in each of our hearts and lives today so that we might better understand we're all going to judge. We're all going to pass judgment. Let's do it in a way that honors God. Let's do it in a way that honors other people. Let's do it in a way that brings the most good, that doesn't tear down, harass, and destroy, that builds up and invites and welcomes all to the cross. I pray, Lord, in those instances where we find ourselves having to make a decision whether we are going to stand boldly for the truth or just try to shy away, Lord, may we be willing in those moments to stand boldly and hold fast to the truth that we have been convinced of and that is empowered by the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Lord, let your spirit guide us as we try daily to walk in and to live in your spirit and according to your word. I pray these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Would you stand with us? Let's sing this song and closing together and then we'll get you out of here. Thank you so much for coming out this morning.